You say, I'm going to go for a walk. Someone gives you a tight half a second too long hug and you're off. You can dive really well here into the water with a direct point. In the blue square on the wall, you watch. Your two arms go up and together like a sharp sword. They pierce the pool so neatly, hardly causing a splash at all. They, the water is liquid glitter under the sunlight. You glide through with ease and control and the water seems to move out of the way for you as you scoop through it with your arms. When you kick out the blue behind, it shoots up and spreads like a fan. Family keep giving you hugs, sad hugs. Mum looks you in the eye and then up sharply to keep the tears in, you guess. And then she pulls you in tight again and says, you know, we love you very much. And you do know, you love them too, but that is nothing you knew. Your love for them and time for them still has its place. It sits there neat and still where it's always been. Morning time, breakfast time, put your uniform in the washing machine time, being driven places in the car time or home, home sick from school time. It's all the other time that's moved. It's empty now and blank. When you get out of the pool, someone comes over and hands you a big glass of orange juice with one of those little umbrellas in it. Cloudy condensation on the glass gets moved away by your handprint. The orange juice is sweet and fresh and it moves off your tongue and into your tummy easily. After you take that first gulp through the red and white striped straw, you let out a satisfying ah, because the orange juice was just what you needed after the swim. Joe and Alice's boy, he was a good kid, full of smiles and such manners on that boy. It could have been anyone's kid, but it was poor Joe and Alice's boy. Joe and Alice's boy, Mo and Jalice's boy, Jal and Molus's oi, Joyless's boy, Owen Malice's joy. He wasn't Joe and Alice's boy to you. Sometimes you feel like a glass of water with a fist being pushed into it and making you spill out everywhere. The twins used to tease you, always ask if Billy was your boyfriend. They'd laugh saying, Billy is your boyfriend, Billy is your boyfriend, even when they knew he wasn't. The twins and Miller wanted boyfriends, so you don't know why it felt the way it did when they asked. All hot cheeks and fluffy brained, but now they don't ask. They say things like, sorry about your friend, or what happened to your friend was really sad. You worry everyone will forget his name and no one will remember what he looked like or the kind of clothes he would wear. You like the place behind the trees because it's quieter and no one comes to tell you how sorry they are about your friend. You think maybe you could gather some bits and make it into a house or something just for you, but that might take a while. You don't really have any money for wood and stuff yet. Right now it's just you and the cushion from home in a plastic bag so it doesn't get wet. Joe and Alice's boy, he just came out of nowhere and those games are always ca causing trouble for the cars. It could have been anyone uh, it could have been any one of the kids running out from nowhere like that. As you float there in the pool, everyone is beaming at you. They can't believe how beautiful you are and how you can swim like that. You try and saying his name as you walk, every, every step in time with a syllable. Billy, 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 Billy. Your hair is long and the sun picks out the threads of it to sparkle as you spin around the pool like a fish. You're never out of breath. You could keep going and going and going. The water like air around you feels light and the body has no restraints at all. Billy, 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 Billy. When you get out of the water, there are hundreds of people around. Billy is there in his striped boots. He is smiling the most out of anyone. He's older too, like you, not just a kid, both grown. The claps keep going and they sound happy and round like a million bouncy balls hitting a wall over and over. Billy, 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 Billy. It starts to feel strange in your mouth. Tongue gets heavy and odd feeling, like after the dentist. And the sounds don't mean anything without him. You stop saying it then. You don't want to lose what it had been before. What seems like magic now. When you call a name loud enough, someone could come running over. You try to tell them it's easy, that you just have to focus really, really hard on the water. Think of every surface of your skin that is touching the water and hold on to how that feels. Then you tell them to imagine on all of this skin, there are tiny hands reaching out and holding on to the water. Little hands shaking hands with the water for you, making a pact that you will float and your body will not sink. 
The water in this pool is on your side. It wants nothing more than to see you move in the blue under the sun. You hear, it's so sad about Joe and Alice's boy. And my heart goes out to Joe and Al, their poor little boy, again and again. You don't know if they don't say it because they don't know or they don't remember or if it is just too sad to put their mouths around the sound that used to mean him. As you're telling them this, telling them how to do it, you start to do it in your mind as well, as if the air is the pool water around you. You start to realise you can feel the air holding you, feel a pact being made again, so you try something. You lift a foot off the wet tiles by the pool and don't lose your balance. So then you try peeling up the other foot, centimetre by centimetre. Real, you realise you are right off the ground and you start to move your arms like a slow, careful windmill. Shakily at first, you start to rise up higher and away from it all. You go up and up and up and soon you have it, moving around in the air with the same ease as the water. You can swoop higher and do dips because the sky is bigger than the pool. You hear some people below exclaiming in shock, but most are just silent taking it in because they've never seen anything like this before and they don't know if they ever will again. Sometimes when you some see something so strange in front of you, you don't know what to do. So all you can do is look, is what you'll imagine they'll say. In the sky, there are patches of sun and shade. The clouds provide an area of coolness like under a tree at the park. In one moment, you are doing a particularly good twirl and get lost in it. Spinning and spinning, you accidentally push yourself through a cloud. It feels like being tickled all over your skin with a feather made of rainwater. From up here, you see that everything has its place. All the houses sit exactly where they, where they are meant to. The houses and gardens are like a patchwork quilt. The roads and fields like squares and ribbons. You take in all the colours. Varying shades of green, some golden yellows and the dark black of wet soil too. There are birds flying beside you. They come close to get a look at you. They've surely never seen, seen a human flying like this, so you understand their curiosity. Moving slowly around the birds, you nod to them to let them know you are no threat, that you respect their place in the sky. Then you move again, darting through the clouds on purpose this time. And after a while, you head back toward the pool to tell the others what you've seen. The tiny people, some with their heads turned up, scanning all around for you, are the size of a needle head at first. But you start to pick them out as you move back down all their eyes and freckles and their faces cracking open with a smile when they see you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosa. And apologies to everyone. We were having a little bit of a tech problem there trying to get the actual uh, images up on screen, but I am happy to report that is all sorted now. Um, so you were able to see Rose's picture there for, for a moment and um, if um, we weren't able to show Kathy's picture so we just thought that we would just show that uh, now so everyone can, can get the full reference before we move on to our next reader. Great, thank you very much. Okay, next up uh, we have Cornelia. Uh, Cornelia is a bilingual poet and artist. They were raised in Poland and moved to Wexford, Ireland as a child. They have completed an undergraduate degree in the study of religions and philosophy. Cornelia is interested in the unseen and writes extensively on the themes of search, love and awareness. Their poetry is predominantly displayed in an abstract and surreal manner. So take, take it away, Cornelia. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren, and thank you, Emily, and thank you, Kathy, for helping me to edit this poem. So um, the idea behind this poem is two souls or entities that are stuck in a maze trying to find each other. And the maze is the carpet that you will see in the photo. And the souls are following a specific path through the patterns and the colors in the carpet. So. It'll be interesting to see if you can specifically pinpoint how I'm going around it. Okay, so this is Soul Maze. Right up, left side up. I walk for a night, I rest for a day, and the ground I walk confuses me. I step on the glossy, bumpy orange, a fleeting of bright silver. That is when I pause and breathe, the pressure too strong but I continue. A step into the snow I am surrounded by a square 
ancient castle with no doors. It is much too pure, too white, the surface. I am gray. I make a pattern of dirt with every step. And the castle hill turns to a trench, angled toward a different perception. A deep, deep trench and it is blood, organs, whale hearts dropped, beatless into a V-shaped valley. Their arteries vomit gurgling red, my feet feel like soggy bread. The sun meets me, walking up the valley. On the flamingo beach I feel you close, as if you're resting in the blue-eyed sea. Get up and walk to me. Upright, left side down. I walk during day and sleep in the night. I travel through frozen dragon's blood. Their statues of silver stone forever stay. I stop to look into their glossy eyes, paint them the colors of my path. Following into the forest, a meeting of branches creates a tall stone slope. Though it is too thin to lose me, I stroll through fields of giant roses, smoothly shaved of their large horns. In through the rusty lanes, I touch metal gateways which were once alive. Each step onto a strip of white, which made me glad that I would not endure a square the size of a castle field. The scent of purple ribbon with wolves was too strong, so I turned askew. I travel straight to the sunflowers, lift my head and glimpse the orange jelly. What I feel here is much gentler than the forced closeness I felt at sea. We meet at the mango jelly restaurant with a rolled up list of questions, wax stamped. Neither of us can tell if our destination is each other. Thank you. Thank you, Cornelia. Next up to the imaginary microphone, we have Mejido. And Mejido is a Canadian American postgraduate student. He is a 2020 2021 Putnam Scholar and the recipient of the Government of Ireland International Education Scholarship. He received his BA from Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, where he studied film, creative writing, and art theory and practice. His published works include fiction and poetry. Most recently, French Night, a short fiction, appears in volume four of The Foundationalist. Thank you, Mihiro. Take it away. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks so much. This is such a fun evening, and I'm very excited to be part of it. Um, let's see. So, yeah, this is a nonfiction piece um, inspired by a picture of an upside down three legged stool. Here we go. It's called The Green Mill. I wondered if the bouncer regretted his scalp tattoo. He told me congratulations when I showed him my ID. It was the first bar I'd been to since my 21st birthday, and this made me smile. I sat at the bar like a regular, but then I realized I was still all wrapped up in my winter attire, a coat, gloves, a green plaid scarf, and a hat with a pom-pom. A pom-pom, I've realized, is something that almost always makes you look younger than you actually are. I'm lucky I got in at all. I had come for the semifinals of the poetry slam at the Green Mill. As I looked around the room, I became increasingly judgmental. I couldn't believe that the people there were serious. Poetry in the United States is the child of academia and hipster bars in Brooklyn. Certainly not Northside Chicago. After all, poetry resides in the hands of the serious professor of English with an MFA and at least two published collections to his or her name. Amateurs surely don't exist in the way that they used to. And so I looked around the busy, smoky room with confusion. The poetry event must be somewhere else, I thought. I didn't believe that such an obscure occasion could muster, could muster more than a few applicants, let alone a crowd. I had heard about the contest through an accidental Google. It was my third year at university, and one of my professors had told my classmates and I to go out and have a, quote, new experience. There's nothing I love more than vague language. I like to think that this assignment was suggested because the professor forgot to come up with a plan for the day. I had no idea where to start. 
So when my roommate suggested I look into some of Chicago's legendary jazz venues, I stumbled across the Green Mill. Unfortunately, there were no live jazz performances that week, but there was a poetry slam and I was curious. An angry looking 60 something stared at me as I took off my coat and hung it up on the rack near the entrance. The place was well populated. People filled the old booths that lined the venue's right side. An ornately decorated bar ran parallel and mirrors and faux gold carvings covered the walls. Further inside was a dance floor in front of a small stage where staff were setting up chairs and tables. It had an old timey grandeur, like I had just walked into a movie set from The Untouchables. I returned to the bar self-consciously because I was still holding my backpack. I thought it made me look young, so I held it down by my side like a man purse. I ordered a red wine, and when the bartender asked again because he couldn't hear, I just said red. He nodded knowingly, as if I knew the lingo, and after taking a few of my crumpled dollar bills, he swiftly returned. It was good enough wine, tasted fruity. From the stage, an old man spoke into the mic as a four-piece band crooned behind him. Above the bar's silvery quilt style mirror was a massive Christmas wreath decorated with a large red bow. It was oddly festive for mid-January, yet it seemed to work well with the atmosphere. I had read before going that the Green Mill had something to do with Al Capone in his heyday. I paused to think of Capone and his cronies strutting through the space with their three-piece suits, tilted caps and toothpicks. What a scene that must have been. Red, green, and white lights shone from their indent indented wall decorations casting their colors across the ornate ceilings. In the far corner stood a brightly lit nude sculpture of a regal looking woman. She was gaudy and gold and had, and had an overpronounced chest that looked comically large, but that was probably due to a trick of the light. Behind her was the cardboard cutout of who I thought to be David Hasselhoff. It turned out to be a black man who I did not recognize. I moved onto a three-legged bar stool next to a woman who told me she was from Haiti. She looked how I felt, lost. I asked her what brought her here. She told me that she liked poetry and writing and even dabbled herself, but she told me she became a doctor for the financial security. She didn't like the cold and told me that uh, she had read that some cultures hibernate in the winter. I asked her where she got this information because it sounded like a bit of a wives tale to me. And she said that she had read it in that Malcolm Gladwell book about the 10,000 hours. I offered the title Outliers, and she said that yes, that was the one. Behind us stood an old fashioned jukebox. I had never seen a real jukebox before. Once the live band had finished playing, a bartender in a blue cardigan put on a Louis Armstrong song that made my insides warm. When the competition started, I was feeling comfortable. I looked over and saw a young man with curly hair attempt to kiss his bright lipped companion. She looked hesitant, he looked drunk. She kept talking even though he was leaning in for a kiss until it was too close for her to move and then she gave him a light peck. The bar was packed full of these scenes. There were old people with walkers and middle-aged people with shawls. A young couple with prominent black rimmed glasses sat eagerly waiting for the first poet to come up for the semifinals. A 30 something and her mom cheered as the old guy from the band walked from the bar to the stage again. Oh look, he has a tumor on his head. My new Haitian friend whispered as he passed us. He did. It looked benign enough, but I don't know how to tell. She's the doctor. The old man wore a suit and corduroys. His remaining white and gray hair was slicked back and he carried himself in a way that would have probably made him a really cool cat back in the day. Maybe he even saw Capone once. He seemed like that kind of a guy. He reached the stage and spoke into the mic. <clears throat> there are two rules for the competition, the old MC explained. No poems over three minutes. You saw what happened to the guy last week and everyone has to listen to the poem. This was the semifinals after all. There were to be three rounds of poems from two contestants. The judges were announced, well, picked at random from the crowd. Two women, Margaret and Donna and a man called Nim. His qualifications were that he speaks enough English to get by. The first poet came to the stage, white, 30-ish, red shoes. I have an affinity for red shoes, so I was confident that his poetry would live up to his choice of footwear. When the old man asked him if he wanted accompanying music, he said yes. He then turned and told the band that his poem was about birds, so we definitely want some strings. The audience laughed 
and by laughing seemed to shrink the room intimately. His poem was about birds defecating and the frustration that goes along with such an experience. It was actually quite funny and a few audience members whooped. Before the scores came out, the old MC made us count up in French, en deux, trois. Judges Margaret and Donna liked it, scoring it a 7.7 .7 and a 7.0 respectively. Judge Nim, however, was not impressed. His score caused a gasp, a four. The other contestant was an old lady who needed help getting onto the stage. She grabbed the arm of the guitarist who calmly guided her up the stairs. She wore a twinkling gold necklace and didn't understand that you had to speak relatively close to the mic to be heard. She rejected any accompaniment and she told the audience that her first poem was a marriage between want ads and feminine products. Maxi pads and taxi cabs, she said. She absolutely killed it. The room was hooting and she nailed her comedic timing. She reminded me of Joan Rivers. The judges scored 9.1, 9.5, and even Judge Nim came through with a generous 7.1. The next poems were more emotional. The poet with the red shoes spoke about his father and how even though he looked up to him, he was less than perfect. The old lady spoke of her daughter, how she went to live in a hippie shack in California and how difficult their goodbye was. As usual, the MC made us count, un, deux, trois. The old woman again scored higher, but it was much closer this time. Because of her success in the judges scorecard thus far, she had already won the main prize. The MC told Red Shoes that even though he lost, he still could win $5 if he got perfect scores in the final round. The third poems were equally engaging. Red Shoes spoke of his bald boyfriend, some 30 years his senior. It was choppy and explicit, but out of a general sense of support, the judges all gave him tens. He smiled a thankful smile and the audience cheered for a job well done. The old lady spoke of loneliness. She had read her ex-husband's diary after he died and spoke of the things he wrote about her, the affair that had been hidden for years and how she managed to live with this information. After she had finished, the MC said, if I had any more tears left, that would have brought one to my eye. This time, when giving the scores, the MC wanted the language other than French to count up in. He turned to Judge Nim and asked him for his country of origin. Judge Nim told the MC that he was from Ankara and he took to the mic and counted to three in Turkish. I watched Judge Nim listen to us all butcher his native tongue. Beer iki uch, we all shouted. It looked like he was in pain. The old female poet scored well and took home the grand prize, a $25 visa gift card proudly. I have a history of secondhand embarrassment. I get this feeling at the drop of a hat. During a play, if one of the cast members forgets a line, I feel nauseous and have to avert my gaze. For me, it comes from a place of fear. I fear judgment and I fear what people say about me. So I assume that everyone feels the same. During the poetry slam, however, I didn't think about that for one second. Because of the joy and contagious energy they brought to the stage, I didn't think about what any of the rest of us thought. I just sat back and accepted the gift that they shared with us. That night, I watched us all become a school of fish, weaving in and out of laughter and heartache together. The poet's successes and failures became our moments to exclaim, and I was convinced that we were a part of the performance. It was clear that the audience members didn't theorize about who can and cannot be considered a poet. We just watched. Here in Ireland, this is not uncommon. In the United States, however, the poetry slam is an increasingly hidden event. As I said, I only found out about it thanks to a bizarre assignment in my roommate's musical preferences. The readers were far from professional. The two of them had no significant academic backgrounds or publication to their names. They just read. They read because maybe it made them happy or because they didn't have anyone else to read to. Maybe they didn't get to finish school or maybe they took the safe job instead like my Haitian friend. Professional or not, they simply spoke as honestly as they could. I suppose honesty doesn't require a degree, and I don't think I have ever met more honest people. Thank you. Thank you, Mahito. Uh, next up to read is Daniel. So let me tell you a little bit about him. Uh, Daniel is from County Cork. His writing has been published in The Moth, Honest Ulsterman, Acumen, The West Texas Literary Review, uh, Rock and Sling and Offie Press, Mexico. 
He came first place in the Spoken Word platform at Kurt in an International Literary Festival in 2017 and won the May 2017 Sunday Slam in Dublin. Daniel was also shortlisted for the Red Line Poetry Competition in 2018. So uh, thank you very much and take it away, Daniel. Thanks, Lauren. Um, how's it going, guys? Great to be speaking to you tonight. Um, yeah, and I just want to thank thank Lauren for for hosting and Emily as well for this for this brilliant project. It's just a fantastic idea. Um, such a pleasure to be a part of. Great fun to do. Um, so yeah, so the picture I got, the photo I got was of Eamon Casey's headstones. It was just a picture of the building. You might see it in a moment. Um, and what caught my eye about it was the wall itself, um, which was this really rough, dark, kind of ugly, pebble-dashed wall. Um, so that just brought up certain memories for some reason. Um, there are a few things I should tell you before I begin. So Scorn and Oog um, crops up in this poem. Scorn and Oog is a, is a talent show, a kid's talent show run by the GAA. Um, and I was dragged to it often as a child. And I, I once even sang a song at it. Um, and also the final word in this poem is awe. That's spelled A-W-H, as in that, that sympathetic noise we make. Aww. Um, so yeah, that's it. Um, the poem is called Rough Cast, which is another, another word for pebble dashed. Pity this wall, keen to smear all in its own likeness. The Irish sky has washed and washed it down with sooty rain to make a mirror for its scowl. I've seen such sorry walls form clubhouses and barracks, the parish halls where scorn and og is held. May someone else's ma'am or dad console you when you trip at intermission and the nubs of pebble scrape the tip of your nose raw. And when you flee the stage mid note, leaving silence like a cut, I hope the crowd pours forth a bam of awes. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Next up to read, uh, we have Margaret. Uh, Margaret is a writer from Canturk. Um, her poem, Your Fascination, was published in Dodging the Rain in 2018. And currently she's working on her first novel. So thank you very much, Margaret. If you want to take it away. Yeah, um, thanks. Um, the, the picture that inspired this piece didn't come out properly, but I feel that actually worked to my advantage because it made me think and it took me to some very interesting places as I was writing. Hypnopompic. You have seen this image before in your dreams. Let me describe it to you. The grass is dark. It's mounded and wet. There are animals around. They might be rabbits, cats, or dogs. Some of them might be newborns. Any cats will likely be black. At least some of the animals are deformed. The black cats don't walk. They slither, float, hover, teleport. The rabbits reproduce at a terrifying rate right before your eyes. Some of the dogs are dangerous. Their lips are creamed with white foam and they have no eyes. They are missing a leg or have no legs at all. You pad through the marshy grass, feeling your socks dampen. You are looking for someone, an animal, your animal, a loved one that you lost. A pet that vanished or was killed, a ghost from your past. You search for him, her, them, it, through crowds of ghostly creatures that bend and twist, always in vain, 
In this dream, the sky is always grey. It is always your back garden. If it's not your back garden, it's the local park or someone else's back garden. Eventually, the marshy grass starts to rise. It swallows all of the animals until they are dead. It swallows you. The grass rises and rises until you smell nothing but mud and see nothing but black. You taste lawnmowers. You die. If you haven't seen this last image, you will have seen this one. You are in a section of public toilets that are the size of a football pitch. The area is gray. You walk around for some time looking for a stall that has privacy. The toilets are not clean. Almost all of them are broken. Most have no seat. Some are not attached to the wall. The bowls are too big or too small. Many of them are not flushed or can't be flushed. Some of the stalls have more than one toilet in them, two or maybe three. If you are a man, you find yourself standing with your member out in full view of faceless people. If you are a woman, you find yourself on the toilet and realizing that a large section of the door is missing, exposing most of you to the others looking in. Everyone is staring at you. There are no mirrors. The floor is murky white tiles with black roofs. It's covered in a light film of water, grease and urine. There is no smell. The scenery changes and you end up flickering to other people's homes, abandoned changing rooms and overgrown gardens. It ends with you falling backwards into one of the porcelain bowls that has grown to the size of a giant sinkhole. The brown water covers your face. It fills your lungs. You are humiliated. You die. If you haven't seen the last image, you are certain to have seen this. There is somebody driving a car. You are in the passenger seat. It might be in the front or the back. You do not get on with this driver. They are faceless, shapeless, but symbolic of a negative catalyst in your life. The car is speeding. It is nighttime. You are riding down shambolic roads and past black bushes and trees. The shadowy figure at the wheel is losing control. You are unable to move. As you approach a treacherous bend, the figure disappears. The steering wheel spins on its own. The car misses the steep drop after the bend, but still swerves down the road, getting faster every second. The sunroof is open. You stop being frozen and you are hurled from side to side in your seat. The seats in the car are crusted and stained with something. They are dark, but sometimes they look white. The car crashes. You do not experience the crash. Throughout this experience, there is never any sound. You make no noise. You don't know what happens next. But one thing is certain. You have died. Do you remember the rooms? They were vast and overwhelming, in beiges and pinks and yellows. The floorboards would kiss the soles of your feet. The carpets would suck them raggedly. One time you got lost, or it may have been more than once. There would be floors of rooms, some you never even knew existed. They'd be full of televisions, sofas, and beds. They'd all be new. No one would have ever touched or seen them before. The furniture was so new that it was angry. You felt unclean walking through this fresh jungle of inanimate objects. The place swam in silk and varnished wood. You felt like someone or something was watching you, following you. You moved faster through the rooms. It was like you were dancing. You'd never moved like this before. You saw books from the past, words and colors meshing. You tried to read the text, but you couldn't. The books were not what you wanted them to be. 
They were fake. They were pretending to be something you wanted to read, but the pages were either glued together or they looked too wrong. You tasted something. It was the type of taste you get when you travel a lot or in a foreign country. That stale, sweet taste at the very back of your mouth. But you were going nowhere. This world you found yourself in was going to end up closing in on you. It did. It suffocated you, but it did so peacefully. It did this and you died. This happens all the time. While all this is going on, I am processing your life. I pick and choose what provokes you the most, the images that make you feel something, the senses that bring back those memories, the luminous play parks that glowed in the dark, the play areas with warm plasticky surfaces that burned your arms if you rubbed against them too hard. The grass that was ashy and rough when you walked through it in the summer months and the stains that marked your shoes until they were washed off by winter rain. The shiny rain jackets that crinkled in the thin air of the cloakroom when you collected them among the throngs of warm haired children. The first time you scraped your knee to a bloody pulp and didn't cry. I'm not very good with people. I only recreate places, things. The people you see are distorted. They might have the wrong face or be missing a few limbs. In the parcel, anyway, I'm going to give you the backstory about Harry. I also don't like words. Read your story, Mary, about the woman with necrophobia. You know. If you enjoy enjoy writing you will have more nightmares. I don't let you read. The text will wriggle, disappear or not make sense. Try to type something and your fingers will get stuck. Try to search something online. Try to write something down. You can't. The written word does not exist where I live. And then one night you will wake up and it won't be a dream anymore. You will hear voices coming from outside your window. You will be sweating like a pig. Your baby will be crying for you, though you don't have a baby and never will have one. You might feel someone present or a body pressing down on you, pinning you to the mattress. The bed will feel like a dry mouth about to swallow you. You will try and make a noise, but you won't be able to, and there's nobody to hear you. You might wonder why this is happening to you. Don't worry if you don't know what to do. I'll tell you. Mm. Thank you very much, Margaret. And I forgot to mention to everyone actually that there's loads of gorgeous comments in the chat box. So if you want to uh, check those out. Um, so next up is me, um, to my honor. Um, as way of introduction, I think uh, nearly everyone here knows me, um, but I am Lauren Kavanagh Neo Donovan. Um, I write poetry and prose, which are sometimes published, sometimes not. Um, I did have a recent success of having a poem featured in The Echo, which um, for a Corkonian, you know, is the height of fame. So uh, that was fantastic. Um, I see some of my family in the audience today. So like a big child, I'd like to say hi. <laughs> Um, and in relation to this particular piece, I'd really like to thank Peggy, who was my editorial partner, um, because we partnered up to kind of, you know, edit each other's pieces and stuff like that. And uh, Peggy was my partner and she gave me some great feedback. Um, I would also like to thank the Cork uh, Poetry Collective, um, where I workshop this poem as well, gave me some uh, great thoughts and feedback. And um, I absolutely love those guys. So thank you. And in general, I would just like to thank everyone here because if you weren't here, there would not be a reading and that would be no fun at all. So um, when I got my pictures, I was absolutely delighted because I was sort of hoping for something very weird, but instead I got a picture of the sea and I absolutely adore the sea. I am a shell collector and I like making shell art. Um, this is an inherited love from my, my mother, Leon. Um, we like collecting shells together. Um, so when I saw this picture instantly, it just brought this uh, you know, one very specific moment to mind. We go away to the west, um, uh, to beaches like, you know, Banham, Ballyhigh, and down in Dingle, and we go adventuring and shell collecting, checking out all of the beaches. 
but there was this one particular morning which was very special in my memory um, on this particular trip um, it was very emotional um, I spread my father's ashes down in Kerry and, and Banna Beach and this 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 the setting of this poem takes place a couple of days later so it was a very emotional time for me and I think that maybe that was one of the reasons why this particular scene um, you know stayed so clear in my own memory um, it's set the morning, the morning that we left, so we were staying in an Airbnb and we were leaving that morning and I think we had to be checked out at like 10 or 11 and, um, you know, like some sort of shell addicts, you know, we were like check, checking up the tide charts because, you know, you might not know which shells, but like you've got to get the tide just right. And our last opportunity for shell collecting was like five o'clock in the morning, um, which obviously wasn't an option until I decided very last minute that it was an option. And I got up at that time to go down to the beach. And if you don't know Ballyhigh Beach, it is a million miles long. It goes on forever. It's absolutely gorgeous. So I was down there at you know five, six o'clock in the morning all by myself. I had the entire beach to myself and you know watch the sunrise um with the birds who were playing in the waves down there and it was just it was just such a beautiful moment um it was really life affirming and uh, not to be cheesy but uh yeah it was really 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 gorgeous and so i was walking along the we the beach and sunrise was after happening and the locals were after coming out and i see this woman making a beeline for me and there i was with a bag picking up things from from the sand so i thought oh dear i'm in big trouble here this is a local who's gonna chew me out about coastal erosion and uh, all this sort of stuff but actually it was just a lovely lady who came down for a chat and I told her what I was up to collecting shells and she went on her way on her walk and on her walk on her way back she stopped me again because she had collected about 20 or 30 of the exact shells that I was looking for and, and gave them to me so it was just this absolutely gorgeous moment and uh, that's what I decided to write about. And also a shout out to mom because I was exhausted and uh, went back to bed when I got back to the Airbnb. So she had to do all the packing and all the cleaning up and even negotiated a late checkout so, so I could sleep. So yeah, thanks mom. And this poem in the book is, is dedicated to my mommy, which means uh, to, to my mom in Irish, to my mom Leon. So the form of the poem, I don't want to get too technical, but I thought it was worth a mention for some of you uh, poetry form nerds out there. Um, it is a sestina or well a type of sestina and um, in, a, in a sestina you have a very strict form. There are six main stanzas which are made of six lines each so that gives you 36 lines altogether but you must pick six words for those lines to end with. So you have 36 lines but you must end them with only these six words on repeat in a very very specific format and if you actually map out the format in each one, it makes this shape. It actually makes the shape of a seashell. So that's the reason why I decided, uh, you know, to, to go with this form. I thought it was perfect uh, uh, for my theme. And it's the only semi-successful Sistina that I've ever been able to write. So uh, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty proud of that. So yeah, that's enough rambling. I will just get uh, straight into the piece. It's called The Wild Way. The Wild Way. My cottage can hear the midnight ocean tide bringing jetsam, seaweed and shells to submissive miles of fine white sand bound by water, dune and sky. Winds blow doubt from my soul in the emptiness before dawn I am alive. Ballyhaig is asleep but I am awake to hear wisdom whispered by the ocean while her white cap angels strip my soul to redress with sea foam and oyster shells. Under dark clouds performing dawn sky, I walk alone on wild west coast sand. Mermaid toenails sparkle in the sand, half buried and dead, but in my hand alive. Tiny nacre caves capture suns from far sky to sink their purple flames in mother ocean. But the oyster catcher and shell collector have other plans for lost aquatic souls. In my cotton bag where plastic has no soul, jingle iridescent petals plucked from sand. The tinkling chimes sing, shed your shell, surrender self, connect to life. I submit and join the dancing ocean in adagio chasse beneath a bouquet sky. Wet strand reflects the birth of morning, interrupted by another early soul, a local breaking day beside her ocean. 
She stops me as I bend to pick the sand. I share that again, I am glad to be alive. And on his grave will grow a rose of shells. She says it was these self-same shells Mammy sought beneath a long set virgin sky. Still young and soft and to the top with life. They foraged baskets full of shellfish souls and ran home barefoot over rocky sand dunes with willow wrapped gifts from the ocean. Thank you very much. Lovely. Good job, Lauren. Okay. Uh, next up, we've got um, Emily, who, when I get my papers straight, I will just very shortly introduce again for you. So Emily, who you heard from earlier, she's the founder and editor of the literary magazines Fire and Songs and the Disposable Stories, what we're here celebrating tonight. Her writing can be found at Forte Euphemism, and she is a contributing editor for River Sticks Literary Magazine. She is currently writing her first novel. Thank you, Emily. Thanks again, Lauren. Um, so just wanted to say thank you to Mojito for ripping the original draft of this to shreds because it needed it. And <laughs> it really helped me figure out what I wanted to do with this piece. Um, it's a nonfiction piece. It's called The Things That Stick With Me. And um, like I was saying earlier, we were all writing these pieces around Christmas time. And it was actually the first time that I didn't get to spend Christmas with my family. So um, that was kind of on my mind a lot of the time. And I was like, I need to write something. I was struggling to figure out what to write based on this photo because I wanted to write something, you know, profound or cool or whatever. And I just kept thinking of the story um, from when I was in junior high, when I was 11 or 12 years old. So that is, I finally decided, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm running out of time to write this. So I'm going to write about this nonfiction piece. So this is the things that stick with me and I'll share the screen real quick so you guys can see the photo. Great. The things that stick with me. An alligator lived in my grandparents' basement. I never saw him growing up, but I knew his home was beneath the slatted stairs. The grandchildren were never allowed to go downstairs alone unless we wanted to become alligator food. I remember peeking through the lace curtain on the door to the basement, hoping to sneak a glimpse of the famous resident. And when I would go downstairs with my grandma Grace as she changed out laundry or dug through the freezer to find something to cook for dinner, I always kept a mindful eye on my toes as they walked carefully down the steps. As I grew older, I realized that the alligator was just something my grandpa Don made up to, steal, to scare the grandkids into not going into the basement. Yet the joke lived on for decades even up until a few years ago when my grandparents moved out of their home on the corner of Tyler and Franklin and into my Aunt Donna's house. What's going to happen to the alligator? One of the younger great grandkids asked. Don't worry, we set him free in the woods behind Donna's house. After all, no one thought it would be very nice for the, few res for the new residents moving in to find an alligator living in their basement. That was the way stories went on my dad's side of the family. Anecdotes would stick around for generations, weaving their way in and out of each cousin's life and getting warped along the way. We always joked that my grandpa only ever told the same handful of stories, but as I grew older, I realized that the repetitive storytelling gene must be a family trait. There's a story of the zombie chicken. My aunt raised chickens and when one of the hens was sick and dying, she helped ease it towards the afterlife and wrapped it up in a black trash bag before placing it in an empty bin. That chicken must have been bark, part cat because it had more than one life. A few hours later, my aunt walked by the bin and noticed it was moving. The story is told by an Alabama cousin time and time again. Have you heard me tell the chicken story before? Today? No. A different day? Many times. Mm -hmm. Then there's the time my cousin mistook asparagus for esophagus. My dad still calls asparagus esophagus anytime we have it for dinner. The only story that's connected to me happened when I was around 12 years old. My Aunt Jeannie, the second oldest of my, sis of my dad's six siblings, invited my sister Haley and I to go on a trip to Arkansas to visit her two sons and their families. The drive to Fayetteville, Arkansas was only around seven hours. It was a small feat for anyone from the Midwest where everything is spread apart and people would much rather save money by driving for hours 
through flat corn-filled roads, then scrape up the money for a plane ticket. The drive went by quick enough. As the younger sibling, I got stuck in the back seat. I spent most of the ride listening to the pop songs I had downloaded onto my purple iPod Nano. Imagine the Jonas Brothers, High School Musical, really anyone associated with the Disney Channel. With my music loud enough in my headphones, I assumed no one could hear me quietly singing along. I was wrong and my aunt gently asked me to stop singing. Besides that, the only time I remember being spoken to was when we would drive by a field full of livestock. Seeing as we were driving through Missouri, there were plenty of fields full of cows grazing along the interstate. And every time we drove past them, my aunt would shout, look Emmy, cows. With a name like Emily Titsworth, I've had a fair share of nicknames. Some more creative than others. Emmy was actually one of my least favorite at the time. And for some reason, I only allowed family members to call me that. When I decided to move to Ireland, I brought a few things that reminded me of my family back home. I have a small wooden bird that my grandpa carved with a pocket knife for me. The underside of it is stained with wood glue and the bird's eyes are crooked dots drawn on with Sharpie. Then there's a small stuffed dog with brown and white fur who resided in my grandparents' house for as long as I can remember. Well, before I took it anyways. Its eyes are black, plastic ovals. Their details have chipped away as the years have gone on. I knew I wouldn't forget the people I left behind, but I brought these things as a reminder of those cheering me on from far away. I certainly didn't expect a memory over 10 years old to stick with me in a different country though. Over winter break between Christmas and New Year's, some of my friends and I took a short trip to Baltimore. It was poor timing with shops being closed and a massive storm passing through, but we wanted to take advantage of the opportunity to get out of the city for a few days. We took a bus from Cork City to Skibbereen, then had a taxi take us the rest of the way. As the bus wove through roads that felt way too small, I was in awe at the beauty of the rolling hills and small creeks cutting through the earth. Once we got to our Airbnb, I felt a sense of relief at a quiet I hadn't experienced since I moved to Cork. Even as the wind whipped outside and caused the whistling air to leak through the windows, things felt still. We spent our short break walking through the town along the water, spotting the same people and their dogs on walks every morning. I kept quiet, breathing in the sea air and scouring for seashells buried beneath heaps of seaweed and moss. On one of the last days of our trip, we took a cab to Loch Hine, one of the few salt saltwater lakes in Ireland. The sun shone brightly our entire time there. We walked along the easier of the two paths. It took us alongside the water, through trees, and up into the hills. As we trekked uphill, I stopped to take off layers of clothes, only to put them back on a few minutes later as the wind nearly whipped my stock stocking cap off of my head. My knees started to ache and my back was beating with sweat when we came across a field of cows grazing on winter grass. The sky was clear and the Atlantic Ocean was visible beyond the hills. Yet all I could think of thousands, thousands of miles away in a different country was look Emmy cows. Thank you guys. Oh gosh. Yeah. Thank you so much, Emily. Next up, we have Peggy. If I could just uh, remind everyone, uh, just, just for the moment, if you wouldn't mind keeping your mics uh, on mute um, later on now during the break and afterwards, we can have a free for all and we can <laughs> shout each other's down. But just for the moment, it just, it jumps the camera away from, away from people if someone kind of uh, says anything, even accident, even a little cough. Um, so, so please mute, thank you. So Peggy, uh, was born near Skibbereen in West Cork um, and she's lived most of her life in Waterford City. Uh, mm -hmm. She worked as a primary teacher for many years and she enjoyed the great outdoors. She's had poems published in the Fish Anthology 2020 and in Hold Open the Door. So uh, Peggy, thank, thank you. you. Thanks to Emily, first of all, for pulling all of this together. Uh, you should be very proud of and we should be very proud of all our work. Uh, and to Lauren, I was lucky enough to have you as my uh, co-editor with our poems, and that was great. And thank you for emceeing tonight and for everybody um, who's here and all my fellow classmates. And uh, the photograph I got was, um, there was two focal points in it. There was a horse and a dog. And because I wasn't able to incorporate them both into the one poem, I. Hopefully we'll get two poems out of this. Um, 
the horse poem is in gestation and I focused on the dog, as you will hear. So my poem is called Impulse. I watch him on the sunlit lawn, splayed low along summer grass, grappling between outstretched paws, a ravaged bone in his eager jaws, incisors clacking against hollowed shell, the memory of marrow fresh on his tongue. On a shaded path by the flower bed, through the spill of gravel and clay, a jaunty sparrow pecks her way, lifting and landing in tiny bursts. Her dark eye scouts berry and seed, draining the pith from every husk. An evening sun burns down the sky, narrowing lines of slanted light. I shift to hold her shrinking glow, to catch the tapering ends of day. Lingering yet, though the fire has passed, I chase shadows across the grass. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Now, uh, next up, so we'll have uh, two more readings and then we're going to move to uh, our break and our prompt and then, and then into the open mic, just so you know what's coming. And uh, next up, we have Roisin. And Roisin is a writer of short stories and poetry. Uh, she is moved by the bravery that lies within vulnerability. Her writings have been published by the Amsterdam Quarterly, Islands Press, Cork County Library and Visual Verse. She received a notable mention in the Kurt New Writing Prize for Poetry 2020. And Roisin here, the imaginary mic is for you. I probably should unmute myself, shouldn't I? That would be a good thing. <laughs> oh, thank you. Lauren, thank you, Emily. Thank you, Debarra's spoken word. Thank you, everyone in my cohort. Thank you to everyone that's here. Thank you to Margaret and Rosa, who helped me with editing this piece. So um, I got as my photo, I got a photo of an archway leading into a courtyard, which appeared manicured and perfectly paved. But when I took a closer look at the photo, I saw that on the ceiling of the arch, the paint was peeling and it was cracking off. And it made me think of how things are sometimes unseen and how events, sometimes traumatizing, are often kept hidden and remain unspoken. And I believe that within the unsaid, sometimes everything is spoken. And I find that often the grief that surrounds things like miscarriage and the termination of pregnancy does not always find a voice. So in this piece, I have explored the voices of three women, Jennifer, Amy, and Irene. Jennifer has lost her baby in utero, Amy travels overseas for a termination, and Irene was made give her baby away whilst under the care of the Magdalene Laundry Sisters. And I hope through the voices of these three women um, that the intention is that grief is allowed a sounding, a new beginning, and an onwards. So this is called The Unsaid. Irene, under the arch, before the slabs were laid, before the hanging baskets, before the paint was put on the door, before all that, under the arch, under the slabs, asleep in the soil, all the lost babies. Jennifer, I will burn them all. I will tear them down from their crucified state, stack them in a heap, douse them in petrol. The flames will match the heat of my pain, the singe of empty. I have tried driving different routes to work, I cannot avoid them. The referendum placards hang everywhere. Sad telephone poles carry an etching screen. Poor wood marked by cable ties carved into its form. Can you sign the consent form? The nurse stood over me. 
I could not breathe, could not read. I had forgotten where I was. I had lost myself in the absence to the death quiet lands, the nothing, the not being. She handed me a parting gift, the scan. I kept it safe, but could not look. I hear them before I see them. Vote no, anti-repeal demonstrators lift a banner that stretches from one side of the hospital entrance to the other. On it, the image of a living, of a being living in utero. Timing, placement, think, shame on you. Amy, shame. I didn't feel it at first. It came later, after, then the sadness, then the numb. I'm not on the tills. It's work experience from transition year. I'm supposed to shadow a bookseller, except mostly I'm carting trolleys or paperbacks from books into the display tables. I was asked to search through the titles at front of store. A customer had complained that her daughter had found one of those graphic pictures in Girl Missing. They picked the books near the front door, easy exit if they were caught. Among Heaney, Cunningham and Keegan, I found them. I felt the shame then. Irene, he still visits me in my nightmares, the man who I should call uncle. Cap in hand, he lowers his head and bids me a good day. Good day? No, no good days. Ah, there you are, girl, as if he hadn't expected me. It won't hurt a bit now, girl. He had been waiting on the path where the corn was bent, the one where I walked coming home from school. We'll lie down here a bit. Lift up your skirt, won't take a minute. The first time I screamed, I felt like my insights were burned. He pushed his earth-lined hands over my mouth, the dirt in my mouth, the dirt of him inside me. Jennifer, people ask, do you have children? You construct a narrative arc in your head that you rehearse. Your first few stuttering responses have let you down and you have learned from that. You borrow a shell, the one your five-year-old nephew picked up on the beach that day in May. He hands it to you. Special shell, you can make a wish, Auntie Jen. Small fingers cup treasure. In your mind, you will enlarge the shell and encase yourself in it. You are an actor, a pretender. We're not trying at the moment. The line was long and did not undulate. There was no heartbeat. Amy, the lines, the lines that occurred on my body after, the ones you can do under much cover in winter, safe winter soft winter, offers so much, so much wrapping. Jennifer, wrap her up warm, snug as a bug, hold her to your breast, dreams. Irene, I found the sickle in the outhouse. It was my grandfather's, the one he used to cut the corn long ago. I hid it in the ditch and picked it up after school. I was ready the third time. I waited until he was on top. I swung the sickle so that it curved around his neck. He was yanked backwards in his own blood. Jennifer, I put away the receiving blanket. Isn't it an interesting name? Here you are. You shall receive this baby. It is born. It is crying. It is healthy. I consider myself a subspecies the debris of possible playground chats, the outsider, the want-to-be school collector. Can I call myself a parent? No, I could call myself the silent incubator, the 14 weeks and three days of silent growth, the grief mute. Amy, no one tells you about the grief, I know it was the right decision, but no one tells you that you might feel empty, alone, 
Sarah listened, but she hasn't been through it. The nurses were nice. I didn't like Birmingham, though I will never go back there. Irene. He didn't squeal, just let out a gasp. The last thing he said was, oh, Jesus. His eyes went huge, staring right through me. I watched him gurgle, lying on the flat of his back. They found the sickle in the ditch after. Schoolgirl kills uncle in vicious attack. My mother had only been dead a year, and before that, my father had been killed in the fire at the barracks. I was sent to the laundry then. I was 14 years old. Jennifer. She titrates within the melancholy of my bad bloodstream, sad bloodstream. I will keep her safe there, nestled within the core of my womb, my little embryo of lightness that made my breasts swell. She called to me, hello, mummy, I am here. I knew her. The thread of life, the seams of clarity, the lightness of wonder, and now she is gone. Amy, we march together with our placards. Sarah says I should hold the one that says repeal. It is surrounded by a green love heart. Everyone is smiling and laughing and hugging and I am cheering. This is a good day for women. This is what we wanted. Inside, I feel sad. Irene, I know where they put them, baby breaths. Some of them were sick. Some of them had accidents. Some of them didn't come out right. I know where they are now, under the arch, under the slabs of stone. I hear them crying. Jennifer, I linger in loss. Could I put her back in, put back her breath? And you can't say it because nobody knew you were pregnant. When you return to work, you don't say, I lost my baby last week. It is the onset that I am drowning in. I go to the hospital months after for a checkup. They put me in the same room. Antenatal is the same as prenatal, is the same as no heartbeat room. I see, this, I see the nurse out of the corner of my eye, the one who said, are you sure about your dates? And she is laughing with another nurse and I don't want to see I don't want her to see me and then she does and her eyes pass me on as if she doesn't remember as if I am just another Jennifer it has been a year I have put my heart on hold I visit Irene once a week she is an elderly client who lives in a care home she requested a social worker some months ago there is an understanding between us that exists under the silence Irene uses a notepad or sometimes points. She does not speak. She loves two things, dolls and the smell of Milton. Her room is full of dolls, the type you can hold in your arms. She likes to make clothes for them, embroidered cardigans, a crocheted hat with a pink ribbon. Her favorite is Dorothy. She has auburn curls and cupid bow lips. She cleans the toilets at least four times a day. She carries a little tin bucket around with her always. It holds a scrubbing brush, two J cloths and a bottle of Milton. She worked in the laundries with the nuns. The laundry women, what was left of them, were finally released under the care of the community. Most of them didn't survive the transition after years of institutionalization. The lucky ones live in care homes now or supervised accommodation. The not so lucky got their meds mixed up or went mad with the loneliness and ended up in acute mental health facilities. Irene smiles as she opens her bedroom door, Dorothy in her arms sporting a new knitted scarf. She taps the bed where I am to sit. Her wispy frame bends as she kneels to the floor. From under her bed, she pulls out a suitcase, old brown leather with spring locks. One of the locks is broken and flat, and the flap stands upright. Stacks of envelopes lie in cream and white. I think of the christening gown I wrapped up in a dry cleaning bag in the attic. She picks an envelope and holds it to her chest. Her eyes close. 
When she opens them, she hands it to me. It is a letter. Do you want me to read it? She nods with watery eyes. To my darling Ashling, lying in layers upon layer, a suitcase full of letters, all sealed, never read. Irene, she was a year and two months when they took her. I remember the smell of her crown, the feel of the downy hair closing into me. Delicate, so delicate. I could have been a good mother. I screamed so hard that day that my voice left me. I'm not sorry I punched Sister Agnes in the face, although she never let me forget it. I named my baby Ashling, but she could have a different name now. The silence, the loss, the years are between us. Amy. I am sitting on the couch in the waiting area outside my therapist's office. On the table beside me like glossy mag magazines, stories of mannequin celebrities living mannequin lives. On the radio, a woman is being interviewed. She speaks of the time she spent living in a mother and baby home. She had to give her baby away, no choice. I had a choice. I made the right decision, but I am suffering. I don't know what it is and then I do. It is the unsaid, inside the quietness, the silence. Jennifer, time changes everything. Another year and there have been apologies from the nuns, truths from the survivors and sadness sifted through the core of this nation. Irene's voice returned the day she was reunited with Ashling. The first sound she made was a long wailing cry. After that, her lips began to frame words like love and you. I promised Irene that I would visit the old laundry building where she spent almost 50 years of her life. The archway still stands, but the courtyard has been cordoned off with yellow plastic sheeting seven feet high. I can hear the hum of machinery on the other side the sound of stone breaking open. I wonder how far down they will have to dig. As I turn away, my phone vibrates. It is Ashling. Mom wants to know how you got on. Tell her they have started digging. No, not that. How was the scan? I look down at the swell of my belly and circle it with my hand. Tell her we are doing fine, Ashley. Just fine. I walk on with the echo of happiness erupting on the other end of the line. In the distance, the digging goes on. The unearthed, allowing and beginning, a sounding and onward. Thank you very much, Roisin. And that uh, technically brings us to the end of the reading, but I would like to ask Kathy to read her poem again, if you don't mind, Kathy, because of the technical problems uh, that we had at the start. Um, so just give a, a quick introduction again uh, for those of you who missed it at the start. But, uh, you know, Kathy's background is in theatre and in movement and dance facilitation. In 2006, she had a chapbook of poetry, I Dare You, published by Tall Lighthouse UK. She's been published in the 2020 Cork Words Anthology and won first prize in poetry at the Westable Arts Festival 2020. Um, for, for, for more details about Cathy, you can see her website at www.humans-being.co.uk. Thank you, Cathy. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, wow, what a... Roisin, thank you. That was amazing to hear that read out loud. Um, so I'll read my, my poem again and uh, also I'm, I'm happy for the opportunity to thank Cornelia, my co-editor. Um, uh, we, we had just such good uh, time together in working on each other's pieces and um, I think Cornelia's um, unique way with kind of magic realism really started to filter into my own work through reading hers and uh, I'm really fascinated by it. I, I have this feeling that 
whatever we can imagine can exist. Whatever we can imagine can exist or will exist or has existed. So anyway, that was also in this poem, which I'll, I'll read again now. Um, is the, is the photo come? I don't need to say anything about it. Is the photo coming up on it? Yeah, it's up there. Okay, great. Company. She came into the city from sheets of birdsong and dissolves of light, shifting in mist and moon. She came into the city from bat wing at dusk to dolphin click at dawn. She came into the city because her mother asked her to. The city's lick of noise terrified her. Her feet juddered on the concrete. The birds were grey, strung silent on songless wires. Damp rot stank up the house's bricks from the marsh below. She couldn't breathe. And then she saw the palm prints of the moss giant etched onto those dirty pink walls the one who lived below the city and had come out at night to keep her company on the roof. A long, long time ago, she took a deep breath and knocked on the door. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you for being so patient about uh, those tech problems. Uh, I think they are just a, a natural part of, you know, the online environment. So I think we're all pretty uh, forgiving about those um great so we have come to the end of the reading um thank you all very very much and maybe a bula bus again for you know everyone who was reading uh, it was really moving and wonderful and uh just absolutely fantastic thank you um so what's going to happen now is um in just a moment maybe right now emily you can bring up the um the the prompts that we have so um what we're looking at here